Hi guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today I have Dr. Jacob Templar back on the show, and we're going to be talking about all things exercise selection and also exercise execution and whether or not some exercises are more likely to cause injury and whether or not they should be avoided or performing certain exercises in a variety of different ways should be avoided, such as locking out your knees on a leg press or rounding your back on various lifts. I think there's a lot of powerful takeaways from this episode, so I think you'll get a lot from this as coaches or trainees. And as a reminder, guys, please do give us a big thumbs up if you're listening over on YouTube and give us a nice comment, subscribe as well. And if you're on Spotify or the like, please do give us a nice five star rating and a great review. We'd really appreciate it. But without further ado, let's get into the show. Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall. And today I have Jacob Templar back on the show. Uh, it's actually been a while since we've kind of spoken like this, Jacob. But I think the last time was a year ago with Kaz and we were talking about range of motion. That was episode 228. And before that was Solo 202, where we talked a lot about different kind of physio myths and different kind of band-aid tools and things like this. So that's the sort of kind of route we're going to be going down because Jacob is a professional physio he is a doctor in physiotherapy and a very very good one and uh, someone I look up to in that regard and who I will go to if I'm kind of confused about things because we have specialities and certainly this is somewhere where you need some speciality uh, in terms of education so today we're going to be talking about a lot of different things in regards to how Jacob goes to assess kind of various Um, things in terms of degrees of safety or kind of injury proclivity and things along those lines, including things like various lifts or ways of lifting and various things that you might hear that are bad or maybe you're kind of under the impression they're bad and maybe they're not. So we're going to be diving into all of that sort of stuff, which I think is going to be really valuable for you guys. But first of all, Jacob, how are things on your end? I've been seeing you've also been lifting heavy weights recently. Yeah, um, I think I don't know. I can't convert this to kilos, but I'm up over regularly doing like uh, I think the lightest thing I do for deadlift now is like 480, and for squats okay. like 405. That's heavy. I always just like divide it by two and add a little bit. I know it's 2.205 <laughs> or whatever. It's like the the multiplier, but um, yeah. that's why I remember when I this is a complete random side tangent, but. Uh, I remember when I was younger and I went to, I don't know where it was, some some other country and the weights were all in pounds, but me being an idiot, I was, I didn't realize. And I was just like, why does everything feel so off? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And now I realize. So uh, it's, anyway, in terms of, yeah, in terms of kind of assessing things that you're looking at in terms of uh, mm. the hierarchy of evidence, an example I kind of gave to you off air was seen myself put up a kind of leg press video and mm. I straightened my leg up at the top of the leg press and I, the, you'll get loads of comments, just people being yeah. like, oh my gosh, like, oh, they're worried about my knees, what have you. And it's because, I don't know, they're given anecdotal evidence of they've seen one guy on this mm. YouTube video doing something horrendous that I don't want to see. So it will be great to hear kind of where does that lie in the hierarchy of evidence versus other things and what are you looking at specifically? Yeah, I mean, so whenever I look at anything, it's always like you want to start – like at the top, I, I don't know, we could start at the bottom, I guess, like, sure. and, and build our way up. So like the bottom would be anecdote, or even like my opinion, like right now, like you're uh, because of the fact that implicitly, like we have biases, like I have a bias towards strength training, or, you know, you might be more biased towards bodybuilding versus I'm more biased towards body, uh, power lifting, um, things like that. Like we, we have things like that. And our memories are technically like memory is not what you think it is. It's a memory of a memory of a memory um, of an event that happened. Um, so we have a lot of these, these issues with that. Um, and, and we'll have things, these are things that they can be either like um, where you are aware of that. And then we have ones where we're unaware of that, uh, which actually happens a lot in physio where like people will say aloud like you know i don't think the body is fragile and, and this that and the other thing but then we'll do things with people that are it's like well well if you don't have that belief then why did you do that with somebody or things like that and um uh from there we get into like uh what we would call is like a case here a case study case series where technically it's a, it's a one-off event or a small number of events um where you haven't really done any 
things to take out these biases we might have. You're just reporting like, and usually these are you, these are still important because, you know, anecdote is not completely to be ignored, but uh, in these cases aren't to be ignored. Cause usually it's like rare, rare things or when you're first establishing something in, in literature, like this is where we're starting. Um, and then maybe from there we go, you know, there's other types of studies, like you could do a cohort, um, but then like to me, the next level up, like we're kind of evolving would be like a randomized control trial um, where you're trying to, as much as you can uh, minimize the, the biases or those, those issues by taking away, you know, like in well, like with drugs, because the easiest for people to think of these and remember them, you try and do a, like a double blinded control trial. So it's where, say, if you were my doctor, and I was going in, and I was one of the participants in the study, I'd go in, I'd say, okay, I have X, Y, or Z condition, I meet the inclusion criteria. So the factors about me are what you're trying to look at. Um, I don't have any of the factors that you're trying to exclude, or there could be safety concerns. Um, and you're like, okay, well, let's give you this, this medication as part of this study, but you don't know if it's actually the medicine or a sugar pill. And I also don't know if it's a, the medicine or sugar pill. And we won't know, either of us won't know until the end. Um, because that helps to get rid of a lot of these biases or complete placebo effect, which there've been a lot of studies recently on that, even coming out on supplements like, uh, beta alanine, um, like, niacin like which gives a lot of people like the tingling feeling in a in a pre-workout like i know it's completely placebo but i like it so i'd rather yeah. just have it in there um but it still has an effect and then from there we go up to like systematic reviews which is that's looking at the breadth of those trials and trying to put them all together as best you can and give you like kind of the snapshot of like so what is the trend in this information in this topic area um, and what does a lot of it say? And usually a systematic review, there may be some issues with like how different people report different measurements that they're doing or discrepancies, which makes it so you can't like combine them all and then just look at all those data points. Like, you know, Herman Ponser um, had that study came out last year about metabolism. And because they're measuring it all the same way, they did this huge study where they take these points of data and just combine them into a study. And then if you have that, you can do a meta-analysis, which means you're rerunning the statistics on these things and combining them all. And it gives you a lot more power as in like you have more applicability, like how likely is this going to apply to somebody walking down the street? Because you have so many more points of information that's much more likely to represent a group of people that you're trying to look at. So it's um, like, go ahead. I was just going to say that it makes a lot of sense that, yeah, for that's it's frustrating, I guess, for a general population type of person, mm -hmm. someone who's just going to the gym, who's not into like our little niche and like evidence based practice. Yeah. They're not thinking about, oh, there's like these controlled conditions and these studies yeah. on like loads of different people, and I should be looking at the meta analysis. They're like scrolling across their Instagram feed or whatever. They're like, oh my God, that one person blew out their knees mm -hmm. doing this. And, then that spreads like wildfire and maybe, uh, well, I would say almost definitely probably sees more eyes on it than the meta-analysis right at the top of the evidence <laughs> hierarchy and leads people to like these, I don't know, maybe a myth pursuing out there that something's inherently bad when it's like, oh, actually, when we're under controlled conditions and testing across multiple different people, we're seeing this outcome, not what that one random event saw. Yeah, and, and, and there are even in problems within the data, like, if you are kind of like a like i'm just i would say like i'm in between a researcher and a clinician slash practitioner like where um i try and communicate more science to people and, and try and do it in a good way and admit when i'm wrong and, and things like that yeah. but um especially like recently a couple series that i've done on specific topics like you start getting into these systematic reviews of meta-analysis and you're like mm, like if you know research you'll look at these and you go I don't know, these like numbers don't really make sense from what we tend to know about, like, say, specific, like interventions, meaning like a treatment um, for something like you, there's certain numbers, you just see it and you're like, this doesn't quite make sense. And then what when you do the back research, if you're um, into doing that, and then actually digging in like I have on, on certain things, which can be quite uh, boring for some people, but it's something I enjoy, you you go back and you look and you're like, Oh, well, 
that's showing that because there's actually a bias in the literature where they're only publishing when they find positive things. So they're not publishing when they get a negative or a neutral finding because they have a conflict of interest or something like that. So then when you do a meta analysis or systematic review, it makes that whatever that is look overwhelmingly positive, or it could be vice versa. If you wanted to make something look really bad, you would only say publish studies that makes that look bad. Well, that, and it, I guess that's a good reason where maybe it sounded like I was taking the extreme of we should ignore like anecdotal evidence. I don't, and mm -hmm. I think it's like you said, don't ignore it as something yeah. to, to, to take into consideration along with the rest of the evidence we have. But it's kind of scary to think, obviously, we have, there's big biases, loads of different biases that can come into mm -hmm. anecdotal evidence. But the fact that the, the research itself could be biased from like the bottom up, that's kind of a, a, scary, a scary aspect as well. But I guess there's hopefully sufficient evidence out there and more of these studies that kind of levels the playing field a little bit or we have someone like yourself jacob who's delving into it at that level who can discuss it and uh, kind of diagnose it for those of us looking as well yeah yeah but i'm like i i mean i have friends like i'm not doing this usually alone i have my friends that are like you know i have this guy that's interested in this topic of study and this guy and then so then when i go to look at those things i go hey what have you seen on this can you tell me what I might be expecting? Or I'll just tell them like, Hey, send me a couple of papers. Don't tell me what you think about them yet. And then I'll look at them and I'm going to come back to you and talk to you about it. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's really good to hear actually that there's people doing that out there and then dismantlement. Uh, what am I trying to say? Spreading the information yeah. out to the rest of the public because yeah, I mean, it's a lot to take on <laughs> as an individual. And uh, I know even like that's where, when you get into evidence-based practice and you kind of, I think people can become that kind of PubMed warrior, I think it's yeah. called, where they uh, maybe they only read the abstract and they just take mm -hmm. that. And then it's like, oh, that actually can be dangerous because you start seeing people who do read research and they're like, actually, this this research is not very well done or maybe it is well done, but it's not relevant to you at all. So you have to be careful about just being like, oh, I read this meta-analysis, it concluded this, therefore yeah. this is absolute fact. So you're taking the totality of everything on board and looking into it specifically. Yeah, and there's a, there's honestly a spin on abstracts because the problem is the way that uh, academia is established and like publications are like, um, they wanna attract people to look at that paper or whatever. So they like may not publish certain things because it maybe doesn't find something or you put it, they actually have found that there's a spin on abstracts um, that often, gives like a much stronger stance than what the paper actually says if you wow. read it because they're trying to get more people to look at it and read it um versus just reading the abstract and, and going um but then i mean that gets into evidence-based practice as like people think of it as like being three components so like your experience the evidence and then like a person's preferences but they don't consider that it's not meant to be equal like you should be starting at what the most the evidence says then you go okay well what is my experience as a practitioner my that tell me and then now what are that person's preferences so i'm pr hopefully providing them with the best options to get to where they want to be rather than they come in you know and go oh this is what i want to do you know like say i don't know say somebody comes to you and, and says you know i'm trying to get ready for this contest and and they want to do something with their diet or their training and you're like i don't know like that doesn't sound really great and like you you know i'm you're the coach for a reason too so it's like sure. you know why are you paying me if you're if you're just gonna run it and just ask for me to yes man you yeah no that makes a lot of sense it's like i don't know they want to run a a gram per kilo uh protein intake and i'm just like yeah oh, we, we can lower your protein intake but if you want to actually stand on stage with a decent amount of muscle yeah. Like we don't have to go to the, like there's a range of protein intakes that are going to be successful. We can go to the lower end. So that's like using the evidence alongside yeah. that too. So, uh, and maybe you have some clients that have done that successfully before or whatever. So that makes, that mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. And I like that you used, yeah, the kind of new, like coaching and nutrition aspect because a lot of people listening will be on that side of it versus a physio side. Yeah, um, exactly. And I mean, I'm starting to coach more and stuff now too. Sure. So I'm like knocking my rust off and I'm like, all right, what would people come to me and ask? And yeah. I'd be like, I don't think we want to do that. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, one of the things I wanted to talk about was, and I think this is a really common one, or maybe we should actually start with, because I already brought it up, mm -hmm. the uh, kind of locking the knees out on a leg press. Mm -hmm. And I guess, 
the leg press is the one that you only ever hear it about, but there are other lifts you also yeah. lock your, your knees out on, but just generally locking the knees out kind of what's your kind of position on that? Um, how is it something to be worried about? Is it something we shouldn't do? Uh, how do you feel about it? I mean, it's something that's kind of innocuous. Like if you're not actually like thinking about it, I mean, there are rare instances where you see the videos that I, once people send them to me and I can kind of guess what it is. I don't want to, I don't keep yeah. watching it. Um, but like, yeah, that does happen, but it's like, you know, I have patients that come to me that are in car accidents, but I don't avoid driving my car because they were in an accident. That that's a brilliant, actually, I just have that come back every time just to be like, <laughs> so do you, uh, I always talk about like unracking a squat bar. I'm like, so you, yeah. when you're on rack, like you're under quite a lot of load, or when you unrack the leg press in itself, mm -hmm. like there's some sort of like knee lock. I don't know how people end up, but I'm sure most people end up locking their knees out. So, um, but that's a great example. So in terms of, yeah, the function of the knee, the safety of the knee is, I guess it's similar to like, you know, locking your elbows out on a bench press, yeah. for example. I mean, you have to do that for powerlifting, otherwise it's not a lift, right? So yeah, um, like, are these joints and things meant to be doing that under load? I mean, yeah, like, I mean, there's no reason for them not to be is the thing too, is like, you know, there's the, if a joint can move that way, like why would our, you know, our body would prevent us from doing that if it was like, just not advantageous for us to be able to do that kind of thing in general. Um, you know, for some, it's allowed us to survive in a certain way. And, um, you know, as long as you're progressively doing this and it's not like it's it, the main thing is if we think about envelope of function, it's when you're exposed to something either like, you know, it could be very trivial, but it's, you're exposed a lot to it, like a significant degree, like say like I walk, but if I were to go walk 20 miles today, like you bet that I might incur an injury because it's a huge amount of that. Um, but you know, or there could be like a force, like, you know, um, I'm actually not very good bench presser. So if I like put 500 pounds on the bar to try and bench press that, and then did something like, yeah, I'd probably get hurt because I'm not prepared for that load. So it's, it's, you know, you have to consider that it's like, if you're accustomed to it and you do it all the time, like there's no sense in being afraid of that because you're prepared for it. That makes a lot of sense. It's yeah. You don't want to suddenly whack on a, well, that's, I, I think even that may even be in the literature where people like, if they haven't graded their exposure and they do suddenly mm -hmm. increase loads in particular, like loads and they go up by large amounts, that's like a really quick way to get yourself injured. And so that is that gradual kind of graded exposure, like expose yourself mm -hmm. to the stress, like, um, Hensile's gas, uh, syndrome, general adaptation syndrome in practice, basically yeah. f for those uh, areas as well. So that, that makes a ton of sense. Is there any way in terms of lifting, like for, for me, and I guess a lot of the lifters, mm. hopefully, uh, and listeners, sorry, lifters, lif they're lifters and listeners, uh, they kind of have good technique in terms of they lift under control and mm. all of these factors. Is there any ways where people you'd be like, uh, I'm not sure about that, where maybe like they really forcibly like i don't know jut out the elbows or jut out the knees are the, the things is the, the ways to think about n things not to, to things to avoid essentially when you're lifting i don't often like uh, i mean even i do this in the clinic with people that have injuries like because typically like there's going to be a lot of very and i've actually when like when i was still um working with the strength guys i did a few posts about this and um you know, there, there's some stuff on like dynamic systems theory that discuss these kind of things a little bit. And we would expect there to be some normal variation and stuff that you might look at somebody and be like, yeah, that kind of looks weird, but they've been doing it that way for a long time. Um, and, and honestly, sometimes if you try and change the way they do that significantly, that's where they run into some issues. There, there may be, say like, Cause I was like, if you reduce down, like what we're trying to do on the opposite end of the spectrum, like versus like power lifting, you're trying to create the most efficient pattern of movement. So you can move the most amount of weight possible without expending as much energy, um, versus like bodybuilding, you may want to actually make it as hard as possible. So that muscle has to see more and more tension, um, to force, uh, not necessarily force adaptation, but elicit adaptation, um, you know, so there, there's going to be a wide range. And if you try, like even professional athletes, like they've taken pitchers and gone, okay, we want you to try and throw the ball this very specific way. And like, they're maybe able to replicate that like 75% of the time. 
um, to the degree that they want them to say, do it. Like, yeah, you can change those things, but like everybody's variation is going to be slightly different based on context of like, how did you learn to move? Like, where did you learn to move? Like, what was the society and culture you grew up in? What's the length of your arms or your femurs or different things like that? So generally we have, you know, a standard, like you have to know what basketball is before you can go on the court and play it. Um, but there's going to be tons of different ways to be able to do it. I think that makes a lot of sense. So essentially, if you're lifting with control and you're not doing anything kind of completely new and obscure and like different how you normally have been doing yeah. it you, and you don't feel like any negative uh, in terms of like pain or discomfort, you're mm. probably just fine doing it that way. You don't have to be worried about your knee splitting in half. Is Is there anyone who might be more likely to have that? Maybe, I don't know obviously if someone had like a, a knee injury already and they yeah. were kind of going to that position or if someone was like hypermobile are those people that maybe want to i don't even know if the hypermobile would want to avoid it or not um potentially it's it, i would think it would be more it'd be more like rare genetic conditions or collagen disorders and things like that and even then you may sure. want to encourage them because like um, I mean, we have literature on people with osteoporosis, for example, where they're, they, um, so they did these series of studies in uh, Australia, um, they call them the lift more study. So it's L I F T M O R. Um, and it's specifically to look at like responses from osteoporosis. And they had these people doing 85% of their one rep max on squat. So it was squat overhead press deadlift and then they would do like a pull up to like a uh, drop so they do a pull up and then drop and then land um and what they found is it had a substantial effect on their bone density like improving it so there's some of these processes like if somebody has a dis disordered process of doing that thing it, it appears like loading in a gradual way and, and and having them load more elicits positive changes do you not see the progress you would like? Are you sick of writing your own programs? Or perhaps you need some accountability in order to stick with the plan? Then it's time to start working with us. We at Revive Stronger offer a truly personalized coaching service. You'll get more than just an email with some macros or random cookie cutter program. With Revive Stronger, you will be the center of our attention. You will receive your own fully individualized training protocol alongside a customized nutritional strategy. We create the coaching around your needs, wants, personal preferences, and your own unique lifestyle. Every single week, we delve into your program in order to make appropriate adjustments so that we we get the most out of your time and the best possible outcome. We help both female and male athletes to seriously change their body composition by adding more muscle mass and decreasing fat tissue. No matter if you're a competitive bodybuilder or just want to look better, if you need help with your progress and taking your physique to the next level, our coaching is for you. It's time to make a change, sign up today and let's revive stronger. I think that comes back to your kind of talking about the human body as being quite well and we've talked about it like being quite mm. adaptable and not yeah. super fragile just you have to treat it kind of uh oh what it's kind of similar I, I this was a saying that came from nutrition was like don't i uh, is essentially along the lines of like don't take an extreme approach take a gradual approach mm -hmm. um you want the to coax the body uh not kind of stress the body something along those lines i can't remember yeah. what the exact quote was but it was something along those lines so the body has a chance to to adapt to it and not i guess if in the general adaptation syndrome not go to the exhaust uh kind yeah. of position but and, and that gets into like some of the psychological stuff um like we were talking about off air like i'm i'm going through a series of papers right now on psychology and like fear around movement and and things like that and we tend to be wired in like a way like they, they call it like a common sense model because we tend to be majority of the population at least tends to be risk averse and there's like a evolutionary like benefit to that like you can't have like a society of everybody that's like a risk taker because then you know you end up with lots of accidents can happen when you're taking more and more risks um but you need those people at times because you know you need that person that's going to be you know say if we're in a conflict over resources being able to go to war or be able to go out and look for like the water when it's dried up or go out and hunt the lion or not necessarily a lion because we don't eat those really, but go hunt the gazelle, even though there's lions out there um, and then bring that back versus, but you do need the people that are going to be more conservative as well. 
because that the bulk of the population has got to be made of those. But at the same time, we're, we're wired to remember negative experiences much more often. There's a bias in that, you know, in social media, in the news, like that's what gets more clicks and more attention. And you're more likely to remember a negative than you are a positive. And it takes much more positives to unweigh a negative. But because at times we can be very, very risk averse, it gives, it takes away the opportunity to be exposed to some of these like either exercises or movements or um, experiences that would um, actually disconfirm your bias or your preconceived beliefs about something. I think that's really interesting. The psychology, I mean, it's just how much the psychology impacts mm -hmm. everything like that we do. Um, it's just making me think of, I don't know if you, have you watched Naruto? Yeah. 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 All, all the way up to like, I got to, What's his name? The Toad Sage. Okay, yeah, um, Jiraiya. Jiraiya, yeah, yeah. Oh and man, you'll get that's you're just getting to the good bits. So, <laughs> uh, I'm I'm currently watching it, but it just makes me. It's because I used uh, Naruto in my presentation that I did uh, a little bit ago on genetics, and I was like, used mm -hmm. his like the placebo and how strong that can be, and the psychology and his like stance in at least the first series was believe it. He was like, believe yeah. it, I'm going to achieve this, and he believed it, and so uh, I assume he's eventually going to achieve it because he hasn't done any of that yet for, for where I'm at. Um, but I find it really interesting because also I guess people who are more risk uh, takers are more likely to, uh, maybe to go enhanced. I mm -hmm. know like at least that's what I, I get a sense of when people who have gone that way, that they seem to be that type of person. I, I don't yeah. want to make any assumptions because it's all anecdotal from what I've mm -hmm. seen. Um, yeah, I'm yeah. sure there's some people who aren't that way, but it's interesting because I guess then they're in the gym and they're lifting and they're, they're, they're probably taking some risks potentially more than some other people. But mm -hmm. essentially I think you can be so far the other way where you're yeah. not willing to take any risks where, I mean, to get stronger, to get bigger, you have to stress the body somehow. And if you're not willing mm -hmm. to like push to discomfort, you, you're never going to get there. Um, but I guess it's trying to identify what's like positive discomfort that's going to elicit kind of growth and adaptation and strength versus things that you don't want to feel in the gym. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes it's waiting those things out and then making sure like, am I sleeping enough? Like, you know, do I have some of these negative beliefs that I'm like, you know, like sometimes you have to do things to like um, challenge that a little bit to like be able to recover because you get stuck in this like mental game of like being, um, I don't want to say afraid, but it's like kind of like being afraid to do certain things because you're like, oh, that might make me hurt. But then the way our body develops patterns in association with pain, it's like sometimes literally it's, there's these, um, I was talking to one of my um, good friends this weekend while I was at, I was at like our American Physical Therapy Leadership Congress and I met with a few people and we were talking about that and there's like negative or not negative, um, there's like um, verbal rules we have just for like life and like how the world works because our brain is literally trying to make sense of a very chaotic thing that doesn't really have a lot of structure and we, we kind of like make up a lot of things to to organize how we live and like function through the world um, and our, and our body and brain enjoys that or primarily our brain enjoys that. Um, so sometimes we have to like, just use these things to like break that, you know, that verbal rule. And then you're like, you get somebody and I'll do this with patients. I'll get them to do stuff. And I'll be like, well, what we just did is almost like mechanically or like biomechanically, like very similar to this thing that you have issues with. And yeah. you can see how that didn't cause you an issue. And then they're like, oh, I suppose I could do that. Yeah, that makes that makes tons of sense. And actually is similar to my kind of line of thinking with my clients where um, for the ones that may be a bit more nervous about pushing harder mm -hmm. and going towards failure, like I am very kind of once they have their technique really well i'm like your technique is fantastic you should be super confident in pushing harder and it's kind of having mm -hmm. that i guess position of authority then gives them that confidence to take it forward into yeah. the gym so i guess physio practitioners can take your advice there and also coaches can kind of use that same way of thinking of like when it's appropriate you can kind of encourage your clients to push harder when they feel unconfident in doing so yeah and i mean greg greg knuckles has talked about this on sbs quite a bit you know, him and Eric, um, where they've shown studies where like, if you have somebody in a lab and you push them to failure, like most people don't actually know what failure is. 
Um, sure. Like, I think it was like a study where they had them do it on like bench press and like the average, like the difference between like where, like, it, so it wasn't the average difference, but it was quite a range of like different between what somebody thought was failure for them and what was their like true failure where they, somebody had to be like, okay, I got to pull the bar off of you. Um, and one of the participants, their difference between where they thought they were at failure and where their actual failure was was like 14 reps. Yeah, there can be some huge discrepancies. I imagine most people listening aren't going to fall into that camp, but maybe they, they might, especially if yeah. they are that more kind of risk averse type of person. Mm -hmm. And they, again, it's sometimes I always say this to clients, like sometimes like you don't know where the cliff edge is necessarily until you like start stumbling over that cliff edge a little bit, or you don't know when you're going to get burnt till you get burnt or like Icarus to the yeah. sun type of thing. Like you have to get up there to like know how close he was. So it's like, you have to sometimes push to those points of failure, like actually failing where it's safe and makes sense to and doing it under controlled conditions. Mm -hmm. And again, that can be a safe thing to do, um, which I guess leads into everything we're talking about. Like if you slowly, a kind of adapt towards it graded exposure towards failure training then you're probably going to be okay going there because it's not like it's a sudden like i don't know you're leaving 14 reps in reserve or whatever it was that that person was doing probably 20 um with where they were and then they're suddenly going all out under like uncontrolled conditions so yeah imagine he yeah. had like doms for like <laughs> two weeks <Yeah>. or something <laughs> some of the studies that greg has mentioned i've like looked them up and like one of them was like trying to look at say how far you could push like eccentric training and like training to failure. And they had people do like, it was like, it was, I want to say it was like five rounds of 15 with like 75% of like a leg, leg extension. And they, they only did it like once a week, but I was like, I would be very sore if I did that. And they had them do it for like weeks and weeks. And then it, and then they're like, yeah, by like the fourth week, we, when we did biopsies and blood work, we found that like the signs of muscle damage were like being extremely mitigated again the the adaptation is is crazy so uh yeah and then i guess that covered the locking out of the knees generally mm -hmm. like for most people going to be a, a safe thing to be doing because the the joints are able to do that and we're able to tolerate that in terms of kind of lower back rounding that's one that mm -hmm. gets talked about particularly lower back i think also yeah. any part of the back rounding at all um people we'll see maybe someone do a row again for me as an example i'll be doing like a a row and i'll be up rounding my upper back and maybe some of my mid back mm -hmm. and they're like oh that I, I don't like the look of that or whatever um yeah how much i mean are there certain areas of the back that shouldn't round should round what's your perspective on kind of the, the spine and the movement of that i feel like it's one of those things that like if you don't have back pain it's something we almost shouldn't worry about other than the efficiency of like a lift um, just because it's like, like, uh, Greg Lehman, who, um, is well known, like, um, for reconciling like biomechanics and like pain science and, and different things like that talks about this. And he's like, you know, like, why would you take something that when you have pain, say like people have back pain, for example, may feel better in a certain posture position, but why would we think that just because you feel better in that position when you have pain, it means like that's how you should be doing it all the time. And it's, that's well said. Yeah. And especially because it, it, it reduces say opportunities you have to engage with the environment and things around you, which may actually um, then cause issues in the future because you're of uh, like availability or like um, one of the researchers that I talked to, we call it like affordances. So it's your options of being able to do stuff becomes limited and then that causes issues because now you've put such like restrictors on like what you can do or should do um that it can lead to injury through like stress and avoidance and, and things like that but like lower back in particular too when you when they do emg or not emg they do like um studies where they're looking at like how the vertebrae move actually while you're under load um, it may move while you're under load, even if you look like you're neutral, which, you know, you can control how much that happens, um, which that gets into the efficiency talk. Like if it's going to be more efficient for you to maintain this specific position, then let's just maintain that specific position. But if you round, I wouldn't be like, oh my goodness, I'm going to hurt my back. Yeah, I guess it's in itself. I, I will do this. Like, I, I want to see a arched or neutral spine mm -hmm. on, say, like a, a Romanian deadlift or what have you. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, keep an arch. Once it goes neutral, come back up because we don't want to see that lower mm -hmm. back rounding. And it's funny because you're basically 
it's probably is rounding, but visually it doesn't look like it is. Is that essentially yeah. what you're saying? And it's just the degree to which it is yeah. rounding. So is it when, do you think once visually it's rounding, is that a concern? I don't know if you've ever, I, I think I've even had some clients where like mm -hmm. they don't feel it's rounding. It doesn't feel bad to them at all. And they do quite a lot mm -hmm. of their lifts and before having trained with me where they have had that lower back. It's just like, it's you, quite unique. It doesn't happen very often, but they almost lift like exclusively with what a vision, it looks visually like it's rounding, but have no concern, like have no issues with it at all. Yeah, which I would say for the most part, I don't consider that to be an issue or like I don't always coach people to necessarily avoid that, especially if it's advantageous for them. And I'm just wary whenever I take away the options and ability for somebody to move in different ways. Yeah, you could do it like, right, we're trying to do things in a certain way to elicit certain types of stress on the body. And, and if that's your main focus, and that's your main focus, but I, I just try to avoid the negative narrative of like, you're going to hurt yourself. If you do that, I just say, look, this is the way we want to do it because it's most efficient and, and it leads to the, the adaptations and the stresses that I'm, we are looking to achieve, um, here in this specific context. Yeah. And I think something I've heard is generally if it's a position that you're stable in, so it may be rounded, mm -hmm. but you're kind of maintaining that rounded position that's generally regarded as safer than say your under load and it's gradually rounding like it's moving under the load is that a right or something like is that a statement that's true i mean kind of i mean you can move under load and it and it may not be a concern right because the problem is with certain um how do i say this certain lifting institutions like community colleges and whatnot, um, if you catch my drift, uh, we'll talk about movement under flexion. And a lot of these are based on model-based um, studies. There are some where they look at actual lifters. Um, but the concern is that some of the things we see when it's with actual lifters is that this change in movement sometimes is related to a strategy for them to, we don't know if it's a strategy to avoid um, having more pain and discomfort or um, if it's because of the pain, you know, like if it's something that caused the pain or discomfort. Um, and even then, and we see this in literature still in physical therapy, even though we understand that like pain and injury is much more complicated than, you know, this tissue looks a certain way. So it means that you're injured or hurt, you should have pain. Um, we're only taking one small sliver of what could be related to that person's injury, their level of tolerance for that activity and different things in like hyper focusing on that rather than a lot of other factors that could be at play. Really interesting. Yeah. I think it's like, it's that causation correlation type of thing that's tricky yeah. to, to always pass out. And I guess for the listeners, if they are lifting, would you say it's a concern when it's causing pain or discomfort or you have a pre-existing back injury but outside of those conditions if you're creating the response you want in terms of your efficiency lifting whether that be bodybuilding for, or powerlifting you're probably okay with the position you're in cons assuming that everything's kind of pain-free on that side yeah i mean i consider that to be reasonable right and like if if in the past like somebody's had a very negative experience with that position or or um you know type of thing i'll just say okay we'll just do something different like there's other ways we can variably skin a cat you know we don't have to do things that are we don't always have to try and disconcern and um change somebody's belief like at least not immediately right we sure. may show them over time and just gradually do more where like okay you're in this position and it's okay like you're not going to get hurt um you know or if somebody has like back pain like that's a reasonable modification to make then is to go like let's do this let's change range of motion let's change this this and this you know because that's how i would modify a program to make it so somebody can still train and do the things they want to do primarily makes a lot of sense um kind of similar to the the leg press situation as well in terms yeah. of like as long as it's kind of pain-free and like you're functioning well uh you should be good to go so yeah does that also apply to say i guess uh, one people can't be commonly aware of is on like a barbell back squat and they're seeing butt mm -hmm. wink kind of that lower back is now kind of tucking under is that something you're concerned about is that something you would try and prevent happening or try and uh get them to change their position I mean, to get rid of it typically no because like the the depth of so 
for the people that I'm primarily working with, it's for powerlifting. Yeah. And like a lot of times if you're going that low, it's like because of the competition standards. And it's like, yeah, there's things that we could do to change, but it's like, well, at the same time, like, is it causing you pain? Is it causing you discomfort? Is it an unsustainable way for us to continue lifting? Um, it may not be. So then it's not a concern for me to change that because I, I can't, I can't necessarily just look at something and be like, oh, I know this is going to cause you injury because we just know that the correlation, you know, and also correlation isn't causation. Like I was reading something recently about this and it was like, you know, the, the goal of science isn't to pr prove that this is indefinitely true. The goal is just to get, try and get closer and closer to the truth. And, you know, like Mike Zordo says, he goes, I might've just came up with the fourth worst way of doing this, whatever it is. Um, but hopefully it's a little bit more correct than it was before. Yeah. I hate to think that we're doing everything we're doing in the gym to like, I don't know, grow for, for me, at least growing muscle, like is the, it's currently, it's the best we have now, but it, in 10 years time, we might look back and be like, man, they were doing that way inefficient. Look how jacked we're yeah. getting now. <laughs> that would be, uh, really depressing to be honest, but oh, well, it will be the, we'll be in the, the past then. So yeah, some people will look at, I guess, these barbell lifts in general, like the high bar squat, mm. the deadlifts, and they will see them as maybe lifts that people shouldn't be doing because there's just greater risk than reward. Where do you feel about that? Like, I think you probably like the barbell lifts and obviously mm. you're a power lifter, so specificity dictates you have to like them in that sense. Yeah. But if you were coaching someone else, are they lifts you would avoid because you think they're particularly injurious versus others? It's not because I think they're injurious. And and I almost like, I think that's just a, it's like for some people that have been out there, like a negative thing to think about too, because it's like, you know, why don't we just enjoy it? Like why? I, I don't know. It's almost like I'm like, we're, I see this in like fitness and physical therapy and it's like stuff that we're like, we love exercising so much, but we do so much to put caveats on like, you have to do it this way or you have to do it this way or you have to do, ascribe to the specific tribalism that I'm ascribed to. Otherwise you're doing it wrong and you're not going to see X, Y, and Z. And it's like, like in the literature, like bodybuilding, powerlifting, strongman, like they exist in that spectrum, like of where I just said of least to most um, injuries per thousand hours of training, but then like recreational running can have like an injury rate of like four to like 30 something per every thousand hours of training. But I don't have my patients coming in. If they tell me they like to run, I'm going to be like, no, you got to stop running. Cause you're going to get hurt. You have to, you know what? You're just going to be a bodybuilder now. And we're going to do <laughs> Bulgarian split squats and leg press. And uh, you have to like that now because that's what you're going to be. Losing weight fast while maintaining muscle mass. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? It isn't though. It's reality and we know how to do it. And we will help you achieve this. The mini cup movement is an eight week fat loss program to make you lose a huge chunk of fat while maintaining muscle mass at the same time. We will support you from the beginning to the end so that you see the results you would like to and come out of it much stronger. You'll receive a fully automated spreadsheet that is based on your nutritional needs. You can choose between six different male and female training templates. Over 30 videos will guide you through each and every single step of the mini cut so that you're getting the most out of your journey and that you always know what to do. But the best thing is that you can start whenever you want. The mini cup movement is open 24 seven. So if you want to learn more or you're ready to sign up, hit the link in the description below. So let's revive stronger together. Yeah, I think it's, and it's, I, I think about kind of bodybuilding's we're very fortunate in bodybuilding because there's so many different tools we can use and yeah. variety is actually a beneficial thing for maximizing muscle growth. Whereas for a power lifter, like, is it the lifts or is it, could it, it be any big three lifts or three lifts in general? And it just, because there's such a lack in specific, sorry, such a high degree of specificity. There's just that overuse. Yeah. I mean, you could, I mean, look at like, you know, I mean, West side did it. I wouldn't say that their system is the most efficient for somebody. Sure. It's not necessarily even who are on steroids or not. It's, it's more of like that system was designed when you look at it, it makes sense. Like it, it saves you a lot of time from having to put a suit on like, cause those guys lift in multiply. So it's like, well, if I can use bands and chains and it mimics the stress of like what I would be feeling with a suit on, then let me do that um, without having to spend that much time. Like there's better, more efficient, maybe ways to do that. But you can look at people like, you know, Mike to share with RTS, like 
like how sometimes far away he might get with either himself or people that he trains, but they still go in like, yeah, at the end of the day, you want to get more and more specific as you get closer and closer to competition. Um, but I almost think like, just like, I mean, Derek Miles, who I'd kind of consider to be one of my mentors in physical therapy, and he's worked a lot in sports and stuff. He talks a lot about the athletic development model for children. And the more we pigeonhole those kids and like make them you do just like less and less like the more and more you're specific and less and less you're trying to just develop general athletic or athleticism, the more you see, like they get burned out, the more they get injured, the less likely they are to continue with their sports. So it's like, stop, like just putting blinders on and be like, I can only do these. And we need to like open it up and go, well, what are your opportunities? What else can we do? Like if you're having issues with this, well, great. That's fine. We can do this instead. Um, you know, it's not the end of the world if you can't, and at a given moment, other than competition day, perform a movement to competition standard. Yeah, I think that it makes a lot of sense. And I guess, yeah, if that hyper specificity isn't required year round for a powerlifter, unless they're competing like the entire year, which they're not. Uh, so yeah. it makes sense to back off and use that variety and maybe even change loading in that sense. And it's interesting mm -hmm. actually on the, the bands and chains and kind of that accommodating resistance and how obviously that's been applied to also bodybuilding and change of resistance mm -hmm. profiles and things. But I also think people use it for like reducing injury potentially and things mm -hmm. like this. And it's, it comes down to that kind of correlation and causation again. It's like, are people now using them because they're injured and so they need to? Yeah. And was it the lifts or like, should everyone be using these like bands and things to reduce the risk of injury? Like it's hard to pass out because it's not a controlled study again. It's all anecdote. Yeah. So, but I think I, something, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm of the mind that like, especially because in like our profession, what you see for pain and injury, it's really hard. Like risk factors even are hard to look at. Like I've looked at a couple things on that. And some of the people I know in public health have shown me some stuff. It's like, we assume that risk factors exist like almost in a vacuum and we ignore like there's much bigger levers usually to pull. A lot of risk factors we consider are just things that we can control a little bit more. Um, so like we tend to hold on to those things a little bit more, but honestly, it's like whatever arbitrary method you need to like make the make things make sense for you. And so you can organize them and then just play by the rules of like, you know, only real large, especially for like growth and strength overarching themes is like your volume, you know, volume, you know, um, I think for muscle growth, the number one factor tends to be tension. Um, like as long as you can prescribe to those and you enjoy it, then okay, do that. But don't try and make everybody ascribe to that. It's just like with diet, like Alan Aragon was talking about the other day, um, cause he had issues with somebody, right. He goes, I didn't say keto didn't work. He goes, I just said, whatever diet you need that helps you get in a caloric deficit and stay that way consistently is the one that's best for you. I like that. So almost applying that sense, like whatever exercise you can consistently do uh, for the time being, at least that drives tension through that muscle. Like that's a great exercise for you yeah. in terms of bodybuilding, at least you have that much freedom. So it, I think it's it's similar to the discussion of uh, I've had on the podcast before where people are looking for like the the best exercises and you must mm. do this one exercise it's going to mean no injuries it's got perfect everything you're going to grow the most you're going to get the most strength it's like but probably if you didn't have any variety within your program that exercise in its own right could lead to a problem down the line just because of the wear and tear in specific areas I guess and so you come back to where you are where it's like if they're pain-free they're producing the results you want like it's not that some things are like categorically good or bad yeah it's like i changed so i changed my accessories like i still squat bench and deadlift i have been pretty much on the same program for like let me think since a little bit over a year and a half or so i forgot when i first got my home gym but I pretty much have been doing the same program since then. The only thing that I change is accessories. And it's like, because I either have access to more equipment by doing certain things at work and then coming home and doing my lift, or I'm just like, you know, what? I'm kind of bored of this variation. So I'm going to do a different one or like, um, I just don't like overhead pressing cause I kind of suck at it. And so, <laughs> so I'll do upright rows and, and people are like, Oh, how could you do that? So bad for your shoulder. And I'm like, is it though? <laughs> 
that that's a great one as well actually i always i know uh, brad schoenfeld did a paper ages ago i think on it now yeah. where he basically discussed it and whenever people say like upright rows are bad for your shoulders just like send them this paper and then they're like then people yeah. don't know what to say <laughs> well and i've gotten a lot into the literature on that at least recently and i've actually looked at a couple of papers um that are brand new in print and my um i guess they'd be my colleagues even though i consider their uh, academic and publication careers to be light years ahead of mine um jared powell who's like the shoulder physio and then jeremy lewis who he's gonna be he would be more on twitter um then but he's got over like 100 publications just on shoulder and they're talking about like the idea of like having shoulder impingement and that whole theory of like impingement is actually like categorically incorrect oh wow yeah that's a lot of people talk about that all the time yes it's, it's one of those things that people i don't know where, where the kind of myth comes from but then it just gets spoken about so much and yeah i mean people take it as fact eric eric and omar had that iron culture podcast where they talked about the myth of like deep squatting being bad for your knees sure um, yeah I forget his name, but he always does fantastic episodes when he comes on and talks about the history stuff. I love the episodes with him on there. Um, but it's like a scientist at University of Texas postulated because of this specific measurement they were looking at that like deep squatting would have been worse for the knee because of the amount of force that it put on your knee. And then like Sports Illustrated took it up and like other people took it up and then it just like spread like wild wildfire. And the same happened with like ice like using ice on something. Uh, one of my students did a um, in-service at work about that. And they were like, um, what they, they could find originally was that um, this kid got his arm taken off by like a train. And so um, it was the first time they successfully reattached somebody's limb. And then they were able to keep the limb and it didn't, uh, you know, nothing bad happened. Well, what happened is they, they found that in the interim, that they took his arm and put it on ice and it helped preserve it and then they reattached it and it was able to work fine and the surgeon you know they go and interview the surgeons that had done this for the first time in human history and all that the media seemed to pull out of that was that oh they put it on ice so ice must be good for an injury <laughs> oh my god that's ludicrous that's actually mad i'm just like could you imagine being that surgeon too <laughs> yeah just so frustrated or seeing all of these things oh my god like guys you missed the point <laughs> yeah oh damn so no i don't know where oh yes i know where i wanted to go so we've obviously spoken about like backgrounding we talked about mm. kind of locking out the knees upright rows kind of uh, i think a lot of people think the shoulders the back the knees yeah. very fragile and very easy to kind of injure uh is there any exercises I guess if a client was coming to you, are there any exercises mm -hmm. you, that you would avoid for them? Like just, I don't know, it could be one exercise where you're just like, I never prescribe this or is it, in, I'm imagining it is individual to that person. Yeah, I mean, it's it's usually just that. It's just individual and like um, comfort and ease of doing them. Like, you know, that's, that's a main thing is like, I go like, okay, what's going to have the biggest effect for the amount of time invested um so that's where we usually go to um you know and in a lot of times we can get because of our own biases like stuck in like a few exercises but then i'll see somebody do something again and i go oh you know what let me try that for a little little while um things like that so there, there's typically none that i like completely avoid unless somebody tells me like i i really just don't want to do this or i don't have like access to it like whenever i've signed up with a coach like i worked with you know, I've worked with Alberto Nunez um, as as a client. I've, you know, worked with various people in the strength guys like Jason and then Alfred and Kendrick and um, John and some other people. Um, and then even I've talked to like Chad Dolan more recently too, if people still remember him from TSA. I just um, remember. He came on yeah. the podcast like <laughs> right at the start. <laughs> yeah. And so like, Every single time that I talk with any of those, I go, I hate doing front squats. So if you put front squats, I'm not going to do them. <laughs> yeah. I also hate front squats. Like just fundamentally do not get on with that movement. Same with overhead press. I pretty much suck at that. And so I, I don't like doing that movement either. But um, that's nice to hear because I think there probably are listeners here who are worried to do certain lifts, think there's something wrong with it. But I think 
your kind of answer here is if if you enjoy them, you're getting a good response from them, not a negative response, then mm. they're a fine lift for you to be doing. You shouldn't be kind of scared and worried to do them. Don't do anything kind of completely silly and ridiculous to what you have been doing. I guess even the same for like range of motion. Don't suddenly go from kind of doing a quarter depth to like, I don't know, sinking it as yeah. low as whatever, especially with the same sort of load, like graded exposure, take your time and work there. And again, like you said, if you're getting all positive feedback in terms of all of that, then kind of have at it in terms of like negative feedback or things that people might want to look mm -hmm. out for i know for me it's i don't know if you ever get this i call them like weird body quirks where yeah. it was actually just the other day where i was like i was like i think i was on the pendulum squat i did a set it was absolutely fine felt fine and then i walked over to do my next set and then my knee was just like not feeling good and i was in my deload so i was just like right i'm not going to do the pendulum squat i'm going to try and find something else that's pain free and okay and then today it's literally the day after my knee's like completely fine and i get these kind of weird i don't know i don't know if it's just after lifting for over a decade and you just have these kind of quirks are they things to be hugely concerned about how do you kind of think about those i i mean i tend to use it depends on the person like i have multiple things that I tend to use and it, and it depends on the person's personality that I'm working with. Um, cause I have, I have a scale that I use. That's like pain. Um, I have a scale that I use that's based on like, um, you know, other types of symptoms like stiffness or discomfort or, um, even fatigue and stuff like that. Um, and then others I'll just use like standard RP and stuff. Um, because I've be based on somebody's, personality can give me different you know oh this is going to work better with because of them like so one of the common ones i use for example is like a is like a zero to ten pain scale where like i'd say like zero to three pain, out of ten pain just for the people that do better with like having that number i'm like that's okay like it should be uncomfortable like you should experience that like even if you haven't had an injury like I might expect that be normal, um, a day-to-day -day variation for you to experience because pain is a part of being alive uh, versus like if you get to four or five out of 10, okay, maybe that's, you know, we're kind of pushing it. If we get past that, then that tells us, okay, we're not heading the right direction. And then especially like if that pain continues to persist and then prevent you from doing stuff later in that day or um you know I, I use arbitrary time like 15 to 30 minutes if it persists past that and then prevents you from doing something okay well that probably wasn't good you know let's avoid that for a little while and figure out something else to do i love that i think that's super simple and works really well and it i don't know where i heard it, it might have been um from quinn hennock or something and that's yeah. something i don't quite use i don't think as precise a scale as what you have but i'm like like talking about pain but particularly persistent pain is the one that i'm like that's stuff you want to avoid if it persists yeah. if it's short very short term it's less concerning to me or at least that's the way i've kind of learned from some of the physios i trust so it's nice that you kind of have a similar idea there too and it's funny you mentioned <laughs> uh, you're gonna get you better continue watching naruto because you're gonna get into the pain saga at some point yeah. and that is the best one <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, and it varies depending on the person and even that scale that was that scale was adapted from there's like two studies that it came from. And even those it's like we use this very, very frequently. And it was like only two studies, one of them, which was like a consensus paper. And the other one was just a singular study that they did on um, research for tendon issues, but it's become a very popular scale to use because of the application. So it's like, yeah. All in all, if you have a way for you to do it and it's not preventing people from engaging in more options or activities and keeps them doing what they want to do, like you can kind of do whatever you want because everything technically is kind of made up at some point. Yeah. No, I, yeah, that's well said. So, yeah, I don't think I have um, any other questions. I think you actually covered off things really, really nicely. Um, I think overall, a very positive message for a lot of the listeners and uh, given even some practical take-homes for coaches and trainees alike. So I, I really appreciate that. If people want to kind of learn more about what you're getting up to, sharing what you're doing, I don't know, you mentioned coaching. Uh, where mm -hmm. should they head? So the easiest place always to find me is I am on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, if you just search my name, Jacob Templar, I should show up on either of those. Um, on Instagram, I'm at strength and evidence underscore physio. And I just started um, 
and still getting everything set up, but it should be maybe by the time this is out, um, uh, coaching for ATP performance with uh, James Johnson and uh, Brett over there who, you know, he, he's that um, two-time WMBF. I think he's a lightweight world champion. So, yeah, just think of him as he's buffed up. <laughs> Probably most people know Brett yeah. is buffed up. Um, well, at least on Instagram, actually on here. He's been on the podcast several times too. So, yeah, yeah uh, phenomenal athlete and awesome. That's that's great. I'll make sure that's all linked up as well. I know I follow um, Jacob's stuff over on Instagram and always really interesting stuff with what's going on over there. And I appreciate all your work and the time that you've taken to be here. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for Guys, having me on. I appreciate the opportunity. For sure. Guys, all of that will be linked in the description box below and we'll talk to you soon. Take care. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. Your Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people, uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is going to be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. It's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics, discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.